fire that burns within you, small one, how bright and far this ember grows. We are unsure at this time. How to play within the Ring of Fire. Today, we're going to talk about these books, available now in hardcover on DriveThruRBG. This, this one, also in softcover. You also get a PDF there, or you can PM your main man. We have bundle PDF deals, save you some money. You can pay directly for them. We even one of the PDF deals will get you everything put out on PDF for Within Ring of Fire ever. The first five books are written. Book number three should be out in about a month. And book number six is being written now. We have an, I have an idea for book number seven. I have another writer that might be coming and put a module together. All that stuff, you're covered. We put in a thousand books. You're covered under one price, and you get it first. So, uh, also, you're looking for uh, Within the Ring of Fire games. Get on Raw Immersive Games Facebook group. We have a Facebook page and a Facebook group. They're different. You can join it. There are about 700 people on there. Post up there. Run. Be a flame tender. Run Within the Ring of Fire. Get yourself some players. Google Plus, Skype. Get those games out. Post the games. Uh, so that that's something you could definitely do, and you could talk with the Ring of Fire. You could talk about uh, Kavega Thale, all the things that you that you found that you love. The system is a one roll system. It's two d eight, and it's slick and it's smooth. One of the big problems you'll find with new players is there's so many dice mechanics. This one does this, one does this. Now we roll a d twelve. Now and, and the players is too much. They were there for the for the uh, mystery, for the majesty, for the drama, for the role playing, for the immersion. That's what they wanted. But instead, they got all these numbers and this, and they don't want that. They don't. And you want to make a game as accessible to new players as possible. And you want to make it as fun for old players as possible. And that's what we've done. And we want to, uh, you know, have that one roll mechanic. So with the mechanic, what do we do? You have, uh, uh, you roll a one. Ones don't count. It's like you rolled a zero. If you roll a one and an eight, the one, it's called a suppression. And the eight does not explode. Otherwise, eights always explode. And you keep adding you keep adding the whole pool, whatever you rolled, if you rolled somehow you got eight, 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 you'd add them all together, whatever you rolled on this one, whatever you rolled on the final one that didn't explode, and then you would add in your modifiers, and that would be, be your result. So that's your role for everything. And it helps keep the game fluid. One of the comments we would get on uh, episode one to seven with the Ring of Fire playtest, people would say, are you guys even rolling dice? The answer was yes. And I only spent about 10 minutes explaining the system to the players. That's how easy it is. That's how, how uh, intuitive the system is. Uh, it's very important. When designing this, well, before designing this game, what led me to design this game was the idea that fantasy games are sort of a, a bastion of power gaming out of character, of, of cheating and min-maxing, and just the worst kind of playing. People go, oh, I can't play fantasy games. Uh, this one and that one, oh, they're so terrible. And I said, you know, so that was largely a big part of why I did this channel in the first place, because we'd play fantasy games. And man, I tell you, as a flame tender, I'm sitting there, I'm playing a, a whore out in the street. Then I'm playing a dragon, an angel, and a god himself that's speaking to the people, much like out of Greek mythology. Oh boy, there's nothing lame here at all. This is this is it, man. This is the meat and potatoes of RPG. This is a fantastic excellence and creative delight, being able to uh, sculpt and change one role to the next, and to play, and to personify this is wonderful. And that's the kind of idea that I have for fantasy gaming. I think it is the role-playing genre. I don't think horror is the role-playing genre. I don't think science fiction is the role-playing genre. I don't think drama or action, adventure. No, 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 no. It's fantasy. Because you have so many, 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 many options there. And they can flow and they can be seamless and they can be wonderful. And that's what we want to do. So I've explained to you what the dice mechanic does. Now, I'm not going to break down everything that's on the character sheet. We call it a mask. You can go on drivethroughrpg.com and download a free two-page fillable full-color uh, mask. And, uh, you, you know, you can really have a good look at everything on there. But I will tell you this. It is the first ever character sheet to have the words theme music on there. That's right, because theme music is awesome. Now, if you've never used theme music, it's highly encouraged within the Ring of Fire. Whether uh, your, your group wants to use this kind of theme music, I would, like... Uh, uh, Judas Priest, or Slayer, or Dio, Megadeth, 
or uh, you have something else in mind that's going to work for your group. But you play that while they're doing their soliloquy, while they're talking, and the players, man, they get with that song. They get with it. That's their song. And then you don't even have to acknowledge them. They do something awesome. You know, you're not even looking at them. You're like, you pie them off like it's nothing. You just hit the music, and all of a sudden their song comes up. Oh, and they love it. They explode, and you get the fun factor. You want immersion. You want to keep them in character. You want to keep them there, and you want them to have fun. And those two things together, when you marry them, that's what gets the player laying in their bed at night, staring up their wall, thinking about your game, thinking about the ideas and the imagination that you impregnated their mind with. And they're going over it, and they're craving, and they're dying to play again, and they call you up the next day. And the day after that, and they're badgering you for ideas and information, and they want to play again, let's play again, let's play again. And then they get on the horn with the other guy, and then both of them start bothering you, and then a third guy comes in, and, 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 and the whole thing. But it's a great thing. Because that's when you know you have them. And that's what Within the Ring of Fire is about. That's the reason I wrote the game. So you can have them. So you can do the absolute best you can with that game. You can tell that story that people talk about 30 years from now. And I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm being dead serious. So, one of the other concepts that's very important uh, is your frailty. And that, that's, you know, that's your kryptonite, your silver bullet, your wooden stake, your sunlight. But it could be anything, you know, there, there's so many different things that could be uh, mental derangement, being terrified of the dark, whatever it is. And that helps generate sympathy. Sympathy is what makes a protagonist. You could be badass, you could be evil, but you need to be the protagonist as a catalyst. The catalyst is what the characters are called. We break them down into two different categories, extras and stars. Extras are anything from... Like the the casual stormtrooper to that that badass guy in red is with the emperor with the you know that red stormtrooper that dude wasn't to be messed with if you were if you were low and feeble so they run and we have a, a status adjustment uh, so your character is getting more status and your your caps for how you know where you can raise your skills continues to increase and you get more points for advantages and so forth. And there are other advantages that you might not be able to buy at status zero. You start off with status zero, and you go 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, then you go to one. And that allows you to have that very subtle uh, change. Instead of having, you know, like a DD and d change one, level one to level two, there's always an immersion breaker. You're like, wow, I just got twice as powerful as I was before. Huh, you know, that's, it, 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 it's always a problem for me and for people in my group. And a, a slower curb, there, I think works really well. Now, at the same point, you know, then that basically gives you your more levels. Uh, while it's only zero to 10, it's not really zero to 10 because you have all those little little ticks in between. Now, your character for your stats, you get 61 points. A lot of species have species granted modifiers. They do not give you more than 61 stat points. All species have 61 stat points. They only change your caps or your minimums. Your maximum caps are 12. This is modified, say you had a plus one bonus to your strength and a plus one bonus with your enlightenment, you would gain uh, a possible cap of 13 in both of those. Okay, so that, that's very important to keep in mind. Now, uh, when so, so when you do that, you, you're able to go uh, up to those numbers. And it's 61 points, it's a one for one. There's none of this mathematics. You know, you're, you're adults, but I trust you. And I want you to be able to make the character you have here in your mind. For me, when I make a character, I don't like to be told all this and that. And you get to, no, 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 just, just, you back off. You just give me something to work and let me do it. You understand? And that's what, that's what we give the players. And there's a lot of trust for the players because once you start trusting them, and, and quite out of the bat, you know, this game isn't going to be for that, that bottom 1% player. You know, they, you got to get rid of them. But uh, this is going to be for that player who uh, wants to do better. You know, and it's going to teach you just how to do that. So, let's talk about the two different kinds of skill roles. You have your active and your, your, your passive skill role. Say you want to forge a sword blade with your blacksmithing skill. Okay, well, the sword blade is not trying to fight you. It's not trying to resist you. It's not trying to stop you. But you may do better or worse depending on other circumstances. So, you would roll. And you take the numbers you roll. You add your rating from your stat. You add your grade from your skill. And any, if you have any other modifiers, you might have some other modifiers, depending. You can add those in, too, to the numbers. And then you take that total. You have 10. You did it. But, I mean, you did it fairly well. Almost an embarrassing job. Let's put it to be honest. Below a 10, nah, nah, nah. Yeah, you did pretty much nothing. 
and then every point above that 10, you get less and less, you know, less bad. A 15, eh. A 20, okay, you've done pretty good, you know. A 25, you know, now that's, that, that's something. You know, like a 50, that's a legendary deal. And remember, the dice explode, so, hell, you might hit a 72 and just, whoa! And that should be put over and brought into prominence and to give the player their just due. Remember, the player needs to sell for you, but you need to sell for that player, too. Get them on board, get them going, get the fun generating. That's the name of the game, man. You have a great time. You believe in the story. You see it in your mind. You keep going. You keep coming back. The whole thing blows up. Everybody has energy. Everyone's loving it. Everyone's there next week. That's the that's that that's the mantra right there. You understand, baby? So, let's explain a resisted roll. Now we talked about stars and extra stars. The players are stars, and a lot of other a lot of other embers. Uh, players are called catalyst. Uh, controlled by the flame tender ember like those beautiful little things that are floating around around the fire those airborne embers uh to bring into the imagination so a lot of those guys are stars too so you know let's let's go back we talked about star wars right so so luke skywalker uh is trying to attack darth vader with his lightsaber so luke rolls to hit rolls rolls his attack roll and uh in fact we got an eight there so we would re-roll that so when you take that number you add it up You'd add in the rating from your stat. You'd add in the grades from your skill. You'd add in any other, any other modifiers. You take that number total. Then uh, the defender would roll. In fact, you, you're probably both rolling at the same time. And that, that, that really speeds things up, too, because it's just one roll. You made one roll, they make one roll. So they take theirs, they add them up. To hit someone, you need to roll one better than they do. Uh, the idea of a stagnant armor class, I think, has always been very odd to me. Because that, that puts all the emphasis on, on the person trying to attack you. Just to say you're, and it gets players in his mind that you're standing there like this. No, 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 no. That's not how a real fight goes. I know, I don't know how many fights you guys have been in. I've martial arts for a long time. And uh, in a lot of fights. I've been punched in the face plenty of times. I know how to avoid them. And I know what it feels like when you, you, you don't. Uh, and I know that that is largely incumbent upon me. Yes, a person may have thrown a better punch than they usually can. Or they may have thrown... Uh, one person may be better at throwing a punch than another person, but there's also a tremendous amount of defense involved in that. So you might not be paying attention that well one time, or you might be, yeah, I'm not going to try to take it totally seriously, or I'm going to do this or that. The defender, in fact, if any if any of the two should probably roll, it probably ought to be the defender, uh, as opposed to, to you know, the, the offense. But, I mean, you might take cool with that, but don't. Look at your man, Anderson Silva. That man rolled poor on his defense. He got snuck on, and he got knocked out. That's what happens. So, you uh, uh, have these have these categories, okay? If, 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 if you hit them right there, and that, that goes for a lot of things. That goes for your resistance roll. So, you're, you're rolling to, to resist a disease. Uh, diseases are demons. The demon tries to just slide into you. You're resisting against it. You, you succeed. Or maybe the demon succeeds and gets in you. Uh, so... You know, that's whichever sort of skill it is. And the, uh, weapons are skills. Uh, Non-weapon abilities also skills. They're, they're, they're all skills. And some non-weapon abilities also grant you some use in weapon ability. A blacksmith does know how to use a hammer. He doesn't know how to train it like a military use, so he ain't quite as good as somebody who is crushing weapon skill. But uh, a blacksmith definitely knows how to use it better than uh, someone who never picked a hammer up before. And believe you me, he'll get with you in his forge if he has to with that hammer. Now... When you're uh, attacking that person, let's let's assume that you hit. Now, weapons have a fixed damage rating. Let's say, uh, you know, let's say a weapon has a damage rating of 4, an armor surpass of 2, and a boost of 5. Now, boosts can range, and we're going to get into explaining what all these are. But your weapon damage, that's modified. It's going to be modified by uh, your, either your enlightenment or your strength rating, depending on what kind of weapon it is. And... There are other factors that might that might modify that that damage up, but that's a static up. Now boost, which is going to be your third number, the better you roll to hit someone, the better you hit them. Uh, often, I know I'd have players who say had like a weapon only critted on a twenty in D and D, and then roll that nineteen. Like, yeah, I got a nineteen. Yes, and then they look down and all of a sudden they get sad. They're like, oh, that's a jack to me. Yeah, I got a nineteen, but it doesn't mean anything. But in their mind, they know it. They know it means something because they hit them better than if they roll a twelve. They just hit them better. But then they roll that eight-sided damage, and they go, "Oh, I did one damage," and they're all dejected. They're like, "That. That's not the story the dice are telling." So it aggravates and annoys the players. I said, "Well, well, we can run right off the bat. 
All it is is how well you hit them. A uh, uh, sword always does the same amount of damage. A sword always does the same amount of damage. What it differs on is where it hits them. And that's where how well you hit them comes in. So, basically, boosts are the better you the better you roll, the more potential you have to do damage. So, let's say they roll a 20 on their defense. You need to roll a 21 to hit them. But, w but when you roll a 26, your weapon's not boosted once. That means you've done an extra point of damage. One point might not seem like a lot to you, but we're not dealing with uh, a D and D level of health here. So one point can be can be a lot. You boost. Uh, you roll a thirty-one. And now they're boosted twice. This I'm only this because they're boosting on five. Your weapons can boost four to seven, but this one boosts on five. So you roll a thirty-one, and now you now you boosted twice. You roll a. 36. Now you boost it three times, and when you boost it three times, you start damaging their armor as well. So, the number that you have damaged them by, let, let's say you had uh, uh, 10 points of damage. Now you have another trait on your weapon, which is called Armor Surpass. Armor Surpass is how well that weapon just naturally is about getting around the armor. So let's say they have armor that, uh, that does, uh, has an armor rating of 5. Their armor rating is 5. So you automatically subtract those two points from their armor rating. Now their armor rating is only 3. Okay? So they have 3 left there. And you have done 10 points of damage to them. That's 7 points. You've done 7 points right against that flesh, and that injures them. Uh, you have a, a health gauge, which uh, I'm not going to go into how to calculate it, but it's not going to be tremendously high. And as you increase in status, it, it goes up very slowly. It's not like a DD and d where you're doubling it down. So you start off with the lion's share of it in the beginning, and then you get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Which is to say, you, there's reasons you wear armor. There's reasons you don't just go and attack things. You know, So you, you are a little more fragile. You have to think. You have to be more careful. You have to be more cautious. Um, but you have something called a quick. Now, there's always a sort of disconnect in a lot of games where... You get down to like one hit point. You're sitting there like, well, I can still do. I know I had a, I had twelve hundred and six hit points, but I have one now, and I'm just just as fine as I was otherwise. Well, in the, the health gauge, when you get down to uh, seven in your health gauge, you now have a minus one to every roll you make. Every roll, you are injured, and you register every time you get hit. Say if I did ten points of damage to you, your character. You would go, okay, and then you would you would describe what happened. You're selling. You go, okay, and you're registering. You're saying, okay, this happens to me. And as soon as you get into the quick, all of a sudden serious things are happening to you. You get busted open. You know, you might get your arm broken and your ribs. And it's the player is in charge of all that. You give the descriptions. The better your descriptions are, the more vivid, the more awesome, the more interesting, the more entertaining, the more experience points you're going to get. That's what your experience points comes off of. Yeah, how quality your narrative is, how much you're willing to sell, how much you're willing to put the scene before your character. That's that's very important. You don't play to win. This is about breaking that mentality. It's about coming together to tell the most awesome story. And that's how you win. That's the secret to winning. That awesome story that everyone takes home and high fives after the game and says, that was awesome. And that's art. And that that's that's you know that that's the great hobby of it. But when the health gauge gets down to uh, to one, you're at a minus seven on your rolls. You probably have serious broken bones and are very very damaged. So that's uh, very important to know. You have a one of your stats is called uh, vigor. When you reach a negative integer, one less than your vigor. Let's say your vigor is eight and you're at minus nine. Well, you're dead. And that's it. Now, embers. Uh, basically, when they reach minus one, boom! It's it's on the the uh, the player to describe what they want to do to them. Did they chop the head off, or did they just knock him out Batman style? And that's on that's on them. And you can bring in all the embellishment, all the detail you want, and we explain that how to do that. Not only, I mean, you this is what <clears throat> largely you get your experience off of. So every time. You know, the player's explaining how they damage them. And the Game Master just kind of gives them a little, well, okay, just a little. Or you go, you kind of give them the, the, the high sign. And they go, okay, they, I killed that guy. So I'm going to describe lopping his head off, gutting him. You guys have seen videos I've uh, played in. If you haven't, you might want to watch one of them. Uh, I'll, I'll spend three, four minutes describing how, how I brutally, brutally kill somebody. And much to the delightment of me. Uh, and, and perhaps uh, those watching as well. So that's how you do 
uh, your, your your two different kinds of skill roles. And again, skills cover literally everything. You have fortes that your your little specialties in those areas. Besides skills, you also have something called passions. Every character starts off with three fortes as well, and you can spend advantage points to get more fortes if you want more fortes. Uh, some species like humans, humans start off with like an extra forte. And most species have like some kind of species granted forte, something their species is really good at. And that doesn't count against your other forte. So you can stack those up. It's like, yes, I'm uh, I'm really good at weapon smithing because of my species. And I'm really good at weapon smithing for my species. I got it twice. Otherwise, you cannot stack it up. But uh, so you have your love, your hate, your piety, because those are the kind of stories I want to tell about people who are, who are so faithful they feel it about people who have that epic love story and that love they must find or conquer or do something to to reacquire that woman they loved or or to avenge their child or, or what have you you know that that, that hatred uh, for those who have come and wronged them and and, and and damaged and hurt them and burned their house down and, and done these horrible things you know that gives you fuel those passions they give you a fire to throw on uh, the, the the hearth of gaming so that's that's something that we want to have there and they they scale up zero to 15. And they're restricted down by status. By status zero, they go zero to five, and so does skill zero to five. And then every status you go above that, you can add one more, one more, one more to your maximum cap up to fifteen. Now, your passions um, are different. You start with five points in them, but once the game starts, you are no longer controlled. Your flame tender completely. You know if you. You aren't demonstrating your hate. And remember, this game has soliloquy, so we hear what the player's mind is. If you're like, well, I had this big story of all this hatred, this, that, and the other thing, and you never role play that, you never bring it up, you never think about it, you're doing this stuff, you're out committing all these acts of uh, charity and so forth, like, okay, let's, let's knock that hate down. You knock that hate down by one. And they're like, oh, okay. Or your character develops this whole arc of romantic love story. We can start adding points of love. Your character uh, performs correct sacrifices to your deity. That's right, guys. You talk about deities, you have your piety. You perform correct sacrifices. You live a, a life according to the whim of your deity, according to the tenets and laws of your faith, and you will be rewarded. Your deity will smile upon you, and when it comes time to take your soul home, you will come and perhaps even live as a saint upon the island of your god, past the thousand-faced flame. So there are very real rewards. The higher your piety is, the more you can do stuff. For example, those uh, the mystics. When you're when you're casting your your uh, mystic rituals, you can uh, uh, directly are affected by this. If if you forget and you make your sacrifices and you don't ever do anything, if you're playing a, a heal bot, <laughs> guess what? Your heal thing won't work anymore because your your piety is just gonna down to nothing. Well, you mispronounce your god's name, <laughs> and you don't know what the holy book is. You don't know about any of the documents, the, any of the, the dogma, any of the the, the, the history. You know, you're hanging out with the followers of some somebody your God hates. Oh, you're going to be penalized for these things. And, uh, you know, so that's something to think about. Um, but uh, to put it in very simple terms to, to, make, to make it short, imagine, uh, like, like you say, for like a D&D &D game, if you took down and condensed skills, if you took all your saving throws, uh, which, uh, God, I mean, can be so redundant in a game like that. It's like, yeah, if you have acrobatics, but you also have reflexes. It's like, like kind of similar in it. But... You know, you have all your saving throws, which we call resistance rolls. You have all your weapon. You have all your other sorts of skills, your academic skills, your artistic skills. You have them all there, and they're all skills. And they buy out of the same skill point pool as any other skill. So you are fully in charge of what you have and how good at it you are. There's also some advantages that allow you to kind of kind of supplement that. If you want to play a really high skill character, there's some other ways to, to tweak that out. There's a ton of advantages in the game. The game allows you to build what you want. I like to build what I want. And I imagine you do too. Not, okay, you can only build this. Like we play in like a D&D, &D, like, oh, I'm a paladin, but I really wish I had this ranger ability. Oh, well. You know, no, you can just pick what you like. You know, you got your points and you can spend them how you want it. Sure, it's your choice. So next we come to advantages. And uh, the advantages are, uh, they can be everything. You know, you're... <sighs> You're descended from the line of an angel. All right, well, that's advantages, and we, we keep ticking them up, and eventually, you know, you get more and more to to you know showing that angelic power. Maybe your father was an angel, or a troll, or uh, a dragon, and you can have that sort of advantages. You can have advantages to have more fortes, to uh, be more hardy, to uh, 
really anything you anything you can imagine pretty much. We have tons of them. Every single book has additional advantages in it. Saga book has a ton. Uh, there's a couple in 77 Thrones. There's going to be a bunch in Monsters and Men. And, I mean, they just keep going and going. Uh, book of True Names has a bunch in there, too. You also have Opulence. The Opulence rating is uh, 0 to 15, and the Flame Tender just keeps ticking it up or ticking it down. The game isn't, again, it's not Dungeons and Dragons. You're not dungeon crawling and so forth. I mean, you can. You can explore and dig things up or whatever you want, whatever the, the saga uh, uh, brings about. But you might have a bunch of goats or have a bunch of pigs and, and have these items, and that might increase your opulence. You might find a big hoard of gold somewhere, and that is going to increase your opulence. Instead of having that fiddly bits where you're sitting there and you're marking off every silver and every copper, and, and no, 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 we don't try to do that. We're trying to have you, in the moments, so you have this opulence rating, and it's going to eliminate that. We don't want to have all this all this bookkeeping. You know, that's uh, that's just not fun, and it grinds the game. I try to take out anything that's going to grind the game down, and you want it just to flow. So, your flame tender says, okay, your opulence is down now. Okay, now your opulence is up. So that you know that 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 takes care of it nice and easy for you of course if you got like a something cool like say you found like a ring you're like, oh, i have this gold ring with emerald in it okay fair enough but you don't need to keep track of every every uh, uh coin and i'm going to tell you why that can be a very bad problem say you're running that game where all of a sudden you're like okay you guys are all at a, a merchant house you're like, okay we're a merchant house Good luck with that. Good luck uh, adjusting the pieces of gold up and down of this venture and this venture and how this does and how that is agonizing. Unless you just almost go with this route. So, you know, you say, you go, oh, well, we, we just did it. Ah, 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 All right. That's opulence, my friend. That's how it works. Opulence. I has it, but so can you. So that's what you want to do. Plus, you know, I'm going to put the word opulence on my character sheet. Come on now. You can, you've got to be out your mind. Like that word's not coming with me. But, uh, it works wonderfully. It it takes away another annoying part of the game. Uh, you have imperfections, which are sort of the inverse of advantages, and um, that is. Uh, take a quick look at my other folder here. Ah, when uh, I think I explained boost uh, attacks. Every time a, a single opponent is attacked, say for example, you have three stormtroopers and you have Darth Vader. You have uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. They're both attacking Darth Vader. Uh, Luke Skywalker attacks Darth Vader. Then Obi-Wan attacks Darth Vader. Then Obi-Wan attacks Darth Vader again. All right. Luke Skywalker's attack is a flat. Obi-Wan is attacking Darth Vader for the second time. This means uh, his his uh, his second attack, his, his attack, first attack, which is the second attack against Darth Vader in the round, plus one bonus to hit. His second attack, plus two bonus to hit. They can keep going on and on. Um, actions in a round... When you have rounds, are and and, and the, the game is divided. Uh, you, you have your rounds, then you have your scenes, and you have your days. So, in a round, you have three actions. You have an accelerated action, you have a move action, and you have a normal action. There are uh, advantages, basically, you can buy up to where you could basically be getting like three attacks. Or if you if you had amp dexterity, you could even use like another weapon and have like four. So, so that would be like a complete limit, and that's a very high status character. So it's not, you know, a game where you're getting this many attacks and then more and then more, and you know, where it gets to the point where you're like, ah, oh, enough, stop, you know. Um, but generally, you might have, like, something you can do over here. You know, you, you can channel a little bit of uh, ability from your god and, and maybe maybe uh, perform something better, and then, you know, you're, you're doing your casting or something, and that, that's it, you know. It's designed to go nice and fast. Uh, you have... When you, when you roll, uh, you fumble. If you roll a double one on any roll, it's a fumble. And it's up to the player. Not the game master. There's no charts or nothing like that. Th those slow things down. I mean, they they grind it to the halt. They might go, oh, it's kind of cool and fun to have that chart. But, but guess what? It, it, it's your deal. As a player, you describe it. How how much of a man or woman are you? You know, Are you willing to take a hit? Are you willing to make it cool and you take that scene and make it awesome? Or are you trying to be a little punk? I mean, that's you and everyone the, everyone's sitting there. Looked at you and go, oh, that's all you did, right? No, so so you can't do that. You got to really bring it. You got to make it cool. You got to uh, 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 bring it in there, because uh, that level of trust starts to be rewarded and it starts to be cool. Now you also can optionally just not do that, and you can just assign whatever you want to them. Uh, certainly within your right as a flame tender, we discussed that in the book. That's the way uh, I'm going to do it, and you know I like to hear back from you guys how that works. Now. 
the the roles so basically you know the roles and when you roll them what's very important to take away from this is it's about role playing it's about narrative so if you roll really well you sit there and explain how you did that blacksmithing you sit there and explain how that attack roll looked you sit there and explain that conversely if you did terrible you know you might talk about how you slipped in a puddle uh when you or you know when you were doing that or how how you twisted your ankle uh, when you came down on that jump, you're like, oh, I made it, but I fell and twisted my ankle. And you're sitting there like holding your ankle. And, and you can bring those elements in. And that's what it's about. It's about jazzing the scene up, making it making it hot, making it mean something, you know, adding to it. And that, that's really uh, the whole the secret of the game is a lot, extending players' trust to narrative and then making everything, you know, described. So that you don't have to worry about placement issues. You know, you're having it described, you're bringing it home, you have it in the mind, okay, well, this just happened. Now this happens, now this happens. And you will have people paying attention. It's not roll, miss, go on, roll. No, no, no. We're going to go in and we're going to talk about how they parry the blow back and it's steel versus steel and, and the rain is coming down. You're looking at each other and you smell each other's breath and you're, and you're, and you're like, yeah, and you know, you've got it. And that's... That's a wonderful thing. And then the next person, okay, well, that's what happened. All right, now I'm going to run in it. A big body elbow right to the side of the nugget. Okay. And, oh, look at this. I rolled. So they start going in. And you're like, okay. And, you know, they they, they knock them out. Pay window. Uh, one, two, three. So those are pretty much the core mechanics. We have other games in development that will be using the system. If you have questions, leave the questions below. I hope I explained it well. Uh, you guys have to let me know. Hopefully I didn't miss anything. But um, the system certainly doesn't. And it's certainly going to provide you guys with uh, with, with with the goal of what we have here. So uh, if you have stayed this long, thank you for watching. We'll put the mask up here in just a moment, maybe. So let me know what you think so far about the Within the Ring of Fire system and how you're enjoying this and what your games uh, are like or what sort of games you have shaping up.